Hello, everyone. Um, I think we're just about ready to get started. Um, if you can hear me, please type yes into the chat box to the left side of your screen, please. Great, so I see some yeses. Um, so uh, welcome to Asthma Canada Speaker Series webinar. Our 2018 webinar series has been made possible through educational grants from AstraZeneca, GSK, and Novartis. This is our final webinar in our 2018 webinar series, and the topic today is proper diagnosis and correct testing. I know many of you have been looking forward to this one, and we thank you for joining us. My name is Manaz Rahman, and I am the Manager of Program Programs and Services at Asthma Canada, and I'll be your moderator today. Please note that the webinar will be recorded and made available on our website and YouTube channel. All attendees are muted. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box, which we will be monitoring throughout the session. There will be a question and answer period after the presentation has ended, and our speaker will try to get to the questions at that time. Uh, very quickly, before we begin, I would like to highlight some of the work that we do here. Asthma Canada is the only national organization solely dedicated to helping all Canadians affected by asthma. We're committed to improving the lives of the Canadian asthma community through education, support services, research, and advocacy. We provide education and support to those living with asthma and their families and communities, both in print and online. We offer services like our Asthma and Allergy Helpline, which gives all Canadians free access to certified respiratory educators, and run an asthma and allergy-friendly certification program, which provides a comprehensive list of certified products, consumer tips, tools, and downloadable material to ensure a home environment suitable for people living with asthma and allergies. We advocate to the Canadian government on improving health outcomes for people with asthma. Our current priorities include clean air, clean energy, and equitable access to medica medications and treatment options across the country. You can learn more on our website and join us by participating in our active letter writing campaign to government representatives. We support research for improved treatment options and to find a cure for asthma. In 2017, we initiated a new addition to our national research program to provide grants to emerging asthma researchers in partnership with Allergen and CE. We've recently awarded four emerging asthma researchers um, with grants for 2018-2019, and we actually have an open call for proposals for a master's level student researching early or late onset asthma. Um, if you are interested, please visit our website for additional information. Additionally, much of the work that we do is with our volunteers and members across the country, people living with asthma, their families, parents, caregivers, communities, healthcare providers, educators, and others who are committed to improving asthma care. The Asthma Canada Member Alliance, or ACMA, is a free membership of Canadians who engage in the work we do and provide valuable input on our initiatives. If you aren't yet a member, we encourage you to join us by visiting www.asthma.ca slash join. Please visit our website for more information and feel free to get in touch with me at any time. And now I am very excited to introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Sean Aaron, who led a pioneering study on the misdiagnosis of asthma. Dr. Aaron is a professor in the Department of Medicine, University of Ottawa, and a senior scientist at the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. He's a respirologist with special research and clinical interests in asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and cystic fibrosis. Dr. Aaron's research has focused on clinical and health services research related to the correct diagnosis and treatment of obstructive lung diseases like asthma and COPD in Canadian communities. Dr. Aaron is Principal Investigator and Director of the Canadian Respiratory Research Network, a CIHR Emerging Research Network, whose goal is to bring together researchers across discipline to work together in a coordinated fashion in order to improve understanding of the origins and progression of asthma and COPD in Canada. Dr. Aaron was presented with a 2017 Asthma Canada Lead, Research, uh, Lead Investigator Award for his research in the misdiagnosis of asthma and the prevalence of economic and health burden um, of undiagnosed airflow air obstruction in Canadian communities. So with that, let's begin. And uh, you can take over whenever you're ready, Dr. Aaron. Well, thank you very much, Menez. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it's my pleasure to conduct this webinar. And uh, as Menez said, I'll try to end a bit early so we have lots of times for questions. The, uh, the topic of the uh, webinar is on the correct diagnosis of asthma. And um, the theme of the talk is going to be how we diagnose asthma in Canada and whether we're getting it right 
as uh, and whether we're doing it as well as we should be. I'm first going to start by presenting two actual patient cases. These are people that I saw in my clinical practice. And then I'm going to present some research studies that I think may challenge our assumptions about how the medical community is making diagnoses of asthma. The first patient is uh, a 19-year-old female student. Uh, she's a non-smoker. I actually saw this lady about two or three years ago, so she's a little older, but, but when I saw her, she was 19, and she was referred to my uh, respiratory medicine clinic for chronic cough. Her chief complaint had been that she was coughing for the past 12 months. Her cough was mostly dry, but occasionally she had some white sputum. And in the last six months, she also noticed a bit of intermittent wheezing. Uh, when I questioned her, uh, she initially denied shortness of breath, but she admitted after a while that uh, she had given up team sports because she felt that she was more short of breath than her peers and she wasn't keeping up. And this, this had happened in the last year or so. And um, she hadn't really thought about it much. She had just thought maybe she was getting a bit more unfit than her peers. Um, but uh, she admitted that, um, that, that her ability to play sports was certainly uh, below what it used to be. Um, when I questioned her some more, she said she was occasionally waking up at night with cough. She'd seen her family doctor because of this cough and this wheezing, and uh, her family doctor gave her antibiotics for the cough, but the cough didn't improve. Uh, the family doctor did a chest x-ray, which didn't show anything unusual. Uh, she went back to the family doctor about a month after that and was given another course of antibiotics without any improvement, and at that point, she was then referred to me. Her, uh, her physical exam when I saw her was unremarkable. And this is her spirometry because, the, the, in fact, before I even see patients with suspected asthma, I actually have them go to our lung function lab uh, prior to actually even seeing me. So they go to the lung function lab uh, half an hour before their appointment with me, and, they, and the patients come up to their appointment with me in the clinic uh, basically holding a copy of their lung function tests. And, and, I, and I know some of you are not physicians, and so you don't know how to read these tests. But what this test clearly shows is that this young lady had airflow obstruction. And after uh, she was given four puffs of Ventolin or Salbutamol, her airflow obstruction improved by 18%. We call this reversible airflow obstruction. That is airflow obstruction that uh, improves by at least 12% uh, after Salbutamol. Um, and when patients exhibit reversible airflow obstruction, this is diagnostic for asthma. In a patient who's having respiratory symptoms and reversible airflow obstruction, you really don't have to look any further to make a diagnosis because the diagnosis here is asthma. So this is a young lady who'd been um, coughing for the last year with a little bit of wheeze and some subtle shortness of breath whose symptoms of asthma had gone undiagnosed over the last year. If she had had proper testing in the community for asthma, in other words, if she had had spirometry pre and post bronchodilator, uh, she would have been diagnosed and treated many months previously with appropriate asthma therapy, and her symptoms presumably would have improved dramatically. So remember, this lady had a chest X-ray uh, to investigate her cough, but her family physician never ordered spirometry and therefore never came up with the diagnosis of asthma. So this represents a case of underdiagnosis of asthma. This is someone in our community who is suffering from respiratory symptoms due to asthma, but in whom the diagnosis of asthma has not been made. And I'll get back to this, this term later on, underdiagnosis, but it's a real problem in Canadian healthcare communities and Canadian communities in general. Now, the next patient I'm going to introduce you to is a little bit different than the first patient, because the first patient had respiratory symptoms that went undiagnosed for a year, uh, uh, and eventually we confirmed her symptoms as asthma. This is sort of the opposite scenario. This is a 44-year-old uh, female. She's a notary, and she was referred to my clinic for difficult-to-control asthma. So the phys referring physician, the family doctor, was specifically asking me to see her because the family doctor thought that this patient had difficult to control asthma. The patient's chief complaint was that she was short of breath over the last four years, and she'd also noticed some wheezing as well. Uh, prior to four years ago, this was a very active lady. She was doing long-distance biking, 
and actually, uh, she was actually um, doing uh, uphill biking. She was climbing up uh, into the Gatineau Hills on her bicycle and had no problems doing this. But for the last two years, she's unable to walk even two blocks because of her asthma. So this is a lady who in the course of several years has gone from doing long distance uphill biking to being unable to walk two blocks. This is a dramatic deterioration in her respiratory status. Her past history is that four and a half years ago, she had had a ruptured appendix and had emergency surgery and was uh, basically uh, on the operating table for about six hours. And she was, uh, she was intubated for about a day after that before she was, um, uh, before the breathing tube was taken out in the intensive care unit. And then about three months after this episode of emergency surgery, uh, she started to become short of breath and her asthma was diagnosed at that point. And when I examined her in my clinic, this lady who'd been referred with asthma, she was obviously tachypnic. Tachypnic means that she's breathing at a rapid rate, and she looked uncomfortable simply sitting, sitting in a chair. She looked like she was short of breath simply sitting down. And there was dramatic wheezing over her upper airway, and I could hear the wheezing when she inhaled and when she exhaled. And that's unusual because usually with asthma, we hear the wheezing more often over the lower airways with, with, with exhalation. This lady's wheezing was most pronounced over her neck and over her upper trachea. So I did spirometry in her like I do in all my patients who I suspect asthma or who have respiratory problems. And the remarkable part of the spirometry is not that this shows asthma because it doesn't, but what the results show uh, is an upper airway obstruction. The spirometry curve is very flattened and, and is unusually shaped. And when we see this flattened, unusual shape, we think about an upper airway obstruction. So after I saw the spirometry, I sort of uh, clued into the fact that I don't think this lady actually has asthma. And the next thing I did was a bronchoscopy to evaluate her upper airway. Now, this is what a normal bronchoscopy looks like. When we do a bronchoscopy, we put a camera into the patient's mouth, and then we, we, we extend that camera and we look at their vocal cords. So these white, um, these white uh, lines that you see forming a, an inverted V are the vocal cords, and below the vocal cords is the trachea. That's this, um, this tube underneath this white inverted V. And this is a normal vocal cord and trachea. And what you could see here is normally the tracheal di diameter is about 20 millimeters or two centimeters wide. This lady, uh, in contrast, when I did her bronchoscopy, it looked like this. So these are her vocal cords, which are actually in this, in this picture, the V is upright. But below the vocal cords, we see this tracheal obstruction. We see what we call uh, granulation tissue, which is obstructing the trachea. And rather than being 20 millimeters, as the previous normal trachea was, this trachea is only four millimeters in diameter. Most of it is obstructed. So this poor lady was breathing through literally a small straw. Her upper airway was obstructed from um, a subglottic obstruction. And that's why she was short of breath. This is not asthma, this is upper airway obstruction, and this is not gonna respond to asthma therapy. The way we treat this is actually is uh, uh, using the bronchoscope, we put a balloon in the upper airway and we dilate the balloon and we open up the trachea, we open up the hole. And I'm gonna show you a picture of her upper airway after we opened it up. So we took a balloon and we opened it up and then her trachea becomes normal again. Shortly after we did that procedure, uh, her problems completely resolved. Um, she basically threw away her asthma inhalers and she went back to biking. So the message here is that this lady had gone for years with breathing, breathing difficulties that had actually been misdiagnosed as asthma. She never had asthma, but the physician had treated her for four and a half years as if she had asthma without any success. And the problem instead was upper airway obstruction. Again, if she had had proper testing for asthma and had spirometry at the beginning, she probably would have been diagnosed appropriately as having an upper airway obstruction. And this lady 
represents a case of overdiagnosis of asthma. That is a patient who had respiratory symptoms and it was mistakenly called asthma when she never had asthma to begin with. So moving on, let's talk about what is asthma from a medical perspective. Basically, in order to be diagnosed with asthma, a patient has to have history of respiratory symptoms. That is, they have to have symptoms of wheeze, shortness of breath, chest tightness or cough. And typically these uh, symptoms vary in intensity. So some days are good and some days are bad. But in addition to the symptoms, what a patient must have to be diagnosed with asthma is evidence of variable expiratory airflow limitation. This is a fancy word, which basically means that the patient must have evidence on spirometry of lower airway obstruction. So in order to be diagnosed with asthma by a physician, you need to have symptoms compatible with asthma, but you also need to have spirometry, that is airflow tests compatible with the diagnosis of asthma. So to confirm a diagnosis of asthma, patients must show evidence of either variable airflow obstruction or bronchial hyperreactivity. Now, the problem is that in clinical practice, there are many patients who are seeing their physicians who unfortunately are not being properly tested and are being diagnosed simply based on symptoms. So um, the classic case is, is, is this young 41-year-old uh, notary who I just described, who was complaining of shortness of breath and wheeze, and the doctor, without doing spirometry, diagnosed asthma and treated her for four and a half years with asthma inhalers. Now, I would argue to you that, that, that this uh, standard of practice is actually substandard and is not meeting uh, current guidelines. Um, you can imagine if you went to your doctor complaining of frequent urination. Uh, frequent urination is a possible sign of diabetes. If I went to my family physician tomorrow and complained that I was uh, urinating 10 or 12 times a day, uh, the family doctor uh, could think in his or her head that I have diabetes, but there are a bunch of other things that can cause frequent urination, things like urinary tract infections and prostate difficulties and all sorts of other problems that can cause this, this issue. The family doctor would never um, diagnose diabetes and put me on a diabetes medication without first doing testing to try to prove diabetes. The doctor would typically do a blood sugar or a urine sugar to try to prevent to, to try to prove diabetes before assigning a diagnosis. So these things happen in diabetes, but in asthma, for some reason, uh, this sort of workup doesn't happen as much as it should. And a patient who comes in with shortness of breath or cough may be diagnosed with asthma without any confirmatory testing to make sure the patient truly has the condition. So what do we need to diagnose asthma? Again, we need symptoms and we need confirmatory tests. And the simplest test is a spirometry. In this picture, you see uh, the lady uh, with her nose clip on is, is, is having spirometry done. Spirometry is a safe, simple, quick and cheap test. It takes about 15 minutes. Uh, it costs about $15 and it can be done by anyone who's over the age of six years old. So this is a really simple, easy test. There are no real side effects of this test. Uh, sometimes it's a bit uncomfortable when you have to blow out all the way, but certainly it doesn't hurt, and there are no, there's really no risk at all of doing this test in 99% of people. So the bottom line is that in a patient who presents with respiratory symptoms, clinicians should be ordering spirometry, preferably pre and post bronchodilator, in all of their patients. In some cases, spirometry can't confirm asthma. If the spirometry is normal and the physician still suspects asthma, the patient can be referred to a pulmonary function lab, and there's pulmonary function labs just in just about every community, and there they can undergo something called a bronchial challenge test, where we give them a chemical to inhale, which will provoke asthma, and we can therefore see the asthma on spirometry. That test is a little bit more complicated, but again, it's completely safe and only takes about 30 to 40 minutes to administer. So these are the fundamental tests we need to diagnose asthma definitively.
There are a bunch of other tests you can use to diagnose asthma, but I would say they're rarely, rarely used in clinical practice. But sometimes for people who really uh, aren't diagnosable based on spirometry or a bronchial challenge test, very occasionally a physician will send a patient for an exercise challenge test or will uh, very occasionally uh, uh, treat patients and try to uh, determine after four weeks of treatment if their lung function improves. But the bottom line is, any test that we do in order to diagnose asthma always involves spirometry. If, you, if, if the doctor isn't measuring how quickly you can breathe into a tube, then the doctor isn't doing his or her job to make a proper diagnosis of asthma. So uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about some of the research we've done and the research we're doing to look at this problem of underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis of asthma. And, and for those of you who are physicians or medical professionals and you want to read more about this, uh, th this article was just published last month in the American Journal of Respiratory Critical Care Medicine. So you can find it online and read the entire article if you want. But I'll try to summarize this in my, in my webinar today. So uh, first, we're going to define some, some terms. Um, First, the first terms we're going to define are underdiagnosis and overdiagnosis, and I've sort of showed you a case report of each, but but we'll just go through this very briefly. Uh, first of all, obviously, correct diagnosis of asthma is occurs when the patient's true condition or true disease is asthma, and the patient's assigned diagnosis by the physician is is asthma. An underdiagnosis would occur if the patient is suffering from asthma and is suffering from asthma symptoms but the patient hasn't been diagnosed with asthma, either because the doctor hasn't assigned any diagnosis to the patient or the doctor has assigned the wrong diagnosis to the patient and has diagnosed them with another condition other than asthma that can cause respiratory symptoms. Conversely, an overdiagnosis is when the patient has respiratory symptoms, but they're due to a condition other than asthma, such as our lady with an upper airway obstruction or patients who may be uh, have allergic rhinitis and a chronically dripping nose and sinus that can cause cough. Uh, if these patients with other conditions are diagnosed with asthma, we say they've been overdiagnosed with asthma. What is the prevalence, first of all, of underdiagnosis of asthma in the community? There are multiple population-based studies that have tried to recruit people from the community to see how many folks actually have undiagnosed asthma. And they're, 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 we, we make the, di the diagnosis based on patients who have respiratory symptoms and who get spirometry and it shows classic reversible airflow obstruction. That is airflow obstruction that reverses by 12% and 200 milliliters after bronchodilator. And studies would suggest that an, an incredible number of people have undiagnosed asthma. So within the entire population, about seven to 10% of adults and kids have current asthma. And of those people who have current asthma, studies show a rate of underdiagnosis between 20 and 70%. So this means that there are roughly, um, um, in the entire Canadian population, there are probably about uh, a million to two million people who have undiagnosed asthma. That is, they're suffering from intermittent uh, respiratory symptoms that and, and airflow obstruction that remains undiagnosed. They haven't been diagnosed with the condition. So an incredible large number of people who are undiagnosed out in our communities. Now the question is, are these people who are undiagnosed uh, relatively mild asthmatics? Uh, is there really any clinical significance to folks who are suffering from undiagnosed asthma? And this is, uh, several studies have been published to look at this. And in adults, it was shown that patients with undiagnosed asthma have lower quality of life scores relative to non-asthmatics in the community. They also have more, unsolicited uh, physician visits as well. So if you have undiagnosed asthma, your quality of life is lower um, compared to normal folks who don't have asthma. And in children with undiagnosed asthma, not only was these kids in quality of life significantly lower compared to 
normal children, but kids with undiagnosed asthma on average had more than a week uh, of great of more uh, school absences compared to non-asthmatic kids. That is, kids who are undiagnosed with asthma, who are who have undiagnosed asthma, are missing more school compared to their peers. And presumably, if we diagnosed these kids and treated them, hopefully we could prevent this um, th these school absences and these and these um, these sick days that these kids are taking. So there is an impact and a burden to undiagnosed asthma, both in adults and pediatric patients. What are the risk factors for underdiagnosis of asthma? Well, unfortunately, many of these studies are done in, in countries that don't have a good public health care system and don't have universal access to health care. So not surprisingly, people who are low socioeconomic status, that is poorer people, are more likely to have undiagnosed asthma. And that's likely because they simply can't afford to see doctors. Um, other um, uh, risk factors for underdiagnosis in the community is patients who underreport their symptoms. Uh, there was a study done in the Netherlands that showed that a, more than 50% of patients who had undiagnosed asthma were suffering from respiratory symptoms but had failed to report them to their primary care doctor. So if the patient doesn't complain to the doctor that he or she has respiratory symptoms, there's really no way for the doctor to even think of the diagnosis and therefore these people remain undiagnosed. And, and another important uh, risk factor for underdiagnosis is when spirometry is not done or is done very poorly. Because if you're not doing spirometry, you can't make the diagnosis. It's sort of like if you don't take a temperature, you can't find a fever. Uh, if you don't do spirometry, it's very hard to make a diagnosis of asthma in anybody. Uh, so then uh, you might say, well, this is terrible. You know, there may be a million Canadians out there who are underdiagnosed, who have asthma and don't know it. How, what can we do to address this? So uh, we've actually started a, a study across the Canada called the UCAP study. It's the Undiagnosed COPD and Asthma in the Population Study. We're actually calling people randomly in the community in, with, in 15 communities across Canada. And we're trying to fee, find people who've never been diagnosed with lung disease but who report symptoms of lung disease. That is unexplained shortness of breath or chronic cough or wheeze. And we're, we're administering questionnaires to them on the phone. And then if they report these symptoms, we're having them come into our study and do spirometry to see if we can diagnose asthma in these people. If, they, if we do diagnose asthma on spirometry, we're then enrolling them into a clinical trial to see if once we diagnose undiagnosed asthma in the community, can, if we treat them early, can we benefit these people? So it's 14 study sites. It's a five-year study. It's funded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, that's CIHR. So it's funded by the Government of Canada uh, through a foundation grant. And it's really the first ever human clinical trial to determine if early diagnosis of previously undiagnosed asthma or COPD will improve patient outcomes. We're hoping that we can find these people in the community, diagnose them when they haven't been diagnosed before, and then get them onto early treatment and improve their health outcomes. So uh, we don't have the answer yet, but I'm hoping in the next five years, I'll be able to come back on this webinar and tell you what we found. Our specific objective is to determine what percentage of patients in the community are suffering from undiagnosed asthma and also, as I said, to perform the world's first clinical trial to determine whether if we treat them early for their previously undiagnosed asthma, can we improve their health outcomes? Uh, we're going to be recruiting 4,000 subjects over the five years, and uh, we're going to be determining whether we can early treatment will improve their health outcomes, specifically uh, their health care utilization, that is their number of visits to doctors for respiratory symptoms, and also whether we can improve productivity loss, that is um, uh, sick days from work and school, and whether we can improve these people's quality of life by treating their undiagnosed asthma. Our primary outcome will be uh, uh, unsolicited healthcare utilization events, that is urgent visits to doctors over the one year period. And we're also, as I said, looking at absenteeism from worker school and quality of life, as well as smoking cessation rates.
Uh, in conclusion, we think that this study will be the definitive study to determine the burden of undiagnosed asthma in Canadian adults and to determine if early diagnosis and treatment of these subjects provides benefit. We think that this study um, will uh, affect about 10% of adult Canadians who are estimated to have undiagnosed COPD or asthma who are living in our community. Uh, this is just an enrollment sheet to show you that as of the end of October, uh, we started this study already in 12 sites. There are still two sites that are ongoing, and we started to recruit patients into the uh, study and into the trial. Uh, we're, we're, we're aiming for 4,000 patients. We've got 477 as of the end of October, so we still have a ways to go, but, but we're getting there. Now, the other question I wanted to address is overdiagnosis of asthma and how often is that seen in our Canadian communities? And so I'm going to address this by showing you results from our Canadian asthma diagnosis study that we've already completed. So um, I'll, I'll show you what we found in this study. This was a study that was conducted to determine whether we could rule out a diagnosis of current asthma in randomly selected adult Canadians who had a recent physician diagnosis of asthma within the last five years. And also the study was done to determine whether doctors are using correct testing to diagnose asthma within Canadian communities. And we, we published this last year in the, in the journal called JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association. So those of you who are, who are interested can look up the study. I've given you the reference here. What we did is we recruited patients from the community by calling them randomly on the telephone. And we asked to identify people who, who answered the phone call were asked to let us know if there was someone in the household who'd been diagnosed with asthma in the last five years. If that person had been diagnosed with asthma in the last five years, they came into our study and they came for a, a, a series of diagnostic tests to try to prove asthma in these subjects. In total, we recruited 701 people from the community. They were 51 years old, two thirds were female, and 70% were college or university educated. 60% had been diagnosed within the last five years with asthma by a family doctor, and 40% had been diagnosed by specialists. 87% were currently using asthma medications. Our, our plan here was to find out in these 701 people who'd been diagnosed with asthma in the last five years, what percentage did not have current asthma. In other words, is it possible that some of these people had been initially improperly or misdiagnosed? We put patients who came into this study, the 701 patients, were put through an extensive testing algorithm to try to confirm or rule out current asthma. If we couldn't confirm current asthma, we actually progressively weaned them off of their asthma medications and we kept retesting them until they were completely off of medicines. We also contacted their doctor in the community who made the initial diagnosis of asthma to determine if asthma had been initially diagnosed correctly in the community with proper testing. And here's what we found. We had 701 patients who entered the study. In 613, we were able to conclusively evaluate them for a diagnosis of asthma, i.e. these patients finished all of the testing protocol. And we were able to confirm asthma in two thirds, but in one third of patients who'd been diagnosed with asthma by a doctor in the last five years, we were not able to find any evidence of asthma, even after we completely weaned them off of all of their asthma medications. Right, we took them off all their medicines, they had no symptoms, and they had no physiologic, of, uh, uh, physiologic evidence of asthma when we retested them in the lab. What's happening in the community with regards to testing, with regards to spirometry? Of the 701 participants in our study, only half had actually undergone tests of lung function in the community. Even though they'd all been diagnosed with asthma within the last five years, only half of them had been diagnosed using appropriate testing. The other half of them had been diagnosed simply based on their symptoms and never had spirometry testing. We also showed that those in whom spirometry testing was done at the time of diagnosis in the community, they were more likely 
to have been diagnosed correctly, and they were more likely to have had asthma confirmed when, they, when we put them through our study. So in conclusion, among adults with recent physician diagnosis of asthma, about a third do not actually have asthma, even after we wean all their medications and retest them. So it, 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 this implies that there's about a third of people in Canada who are walking around taking inhalers who may not need them because they don't have current asthma. Uh, asthma is improperly worked up in the community in about half of cases. And we showed that improper workup was associated with failure to confirm current asthma. Uh, what are the ways in which this pra in which practice needs to change? First of all, for physicians, anytime a physician is is making a diagnosis or considering making a diagnosis of new asthma in a patient, the physician should be ordering pre and post bronchodilator spirometry to confirm asthma prior to assigning a patient with a lifetime diagnosis of asthma and prior to assigning treatment to that patient. Doctors are only doing this in half of half the time. The other thing is that physicians should assess in patients who have unexplained respiratory symptoms whether they might have asthma and they should be ordering pre and post bronchodilator spirometry to try to establish a correct diagnosis. The other way in which this um, study should these studies should uh, change practice is that patients need to become more aware of how they should be diagnosed and treated. That is, any patient who suspects they may have asthma or who is presenting with unexplained breathing difficulties should insist that their physician do the proper spirometric testing or asthma testing prior to um, uh, making any sort of diagnosis of respiratory disease. This is just basic standard practice and, and patients have to start insisting that their physicians do the test so that they get better care and better and correct diagnoses. And I think on that note, I am going to uh, end the talk and, uh, and we have lots of time for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was very informative. Um, and uh, we do have some questions that came out of the chat box. But um, if uh, for those that do have questions, this is the time. Please type them in um, and we will try and get to every everyone. So I think I will go back. Um, we had one comment. In the first case of cough and predominant asthma, the problem is also that many GPs will often do a trial of treatment with ICS or OCS and the cough doesn't improve. So patients often come with a preconceived idea that this cannot be asthma. Secondly, ICS or bronchodilators often does not treat the excessive coughing. So even though there is ph physiological reversibility to bronchodilators, um, symptoms do not, and I think uh, they got cut off. Um, Okay, well, that's a, that's a very excellent question. I, I think uh, in the first case, in the patient who has um, cough, um, I would say that um, for the most part, um, clinicians really should never be treating a cough with oral corticosteroids uh, because uh, that would uh, be inappropriate therapy and over-treatment for most patients and probably wouldn't make that many people better. Um, if cough is simply due to asthma, it really should respond to treatment of the underlying asthma with inhaled steroids and or bronchodilators. Uh, the problem is that there are some patients with asthma-induced cough who may have another reason to cough as well. In other words, they could also have cough due to heartburn or cough due to post-nasal drip or cough due to blood pressure medicines, because some blood pressure medicines cause cough as well. And in those cases, simply treating the asthma without treating the other cause of cough may not actually improve things. So um, what I would suggest for any patient who comes in with an unexplained cough, the basic workup should be a chest X-ray and pre and post bronchodilator spirometry to try to get the diagnosis. If the x-ray is normal and the pre and post bronchodilator spirometry shows asthma, then treatment with inhaled steroids is certainly appropriate. And in most cases, the cough will go away. Sometimes if the patient has asthma and another condition, such as asthma and heartburn or asthma and nasal drip, 
you have to treat the other condition as well to get the cost significantly better. Great, thank you. Um, another question, confirmation of asthma in adult post-bronchodilators, should it be 12% and 200 ml improvement? Yes, that's the standard uh, definition we use. A 12% and 200 ml improvement in the FEV1 after bronchodilator is diagnostic of reversible airflow obstruction, which in the right clinical context is diagnostic of asthma. Great. Um, can we ask our family doctor to do this barometry test? I have been diagnosed with asthma, but never had this test and on daily inhaler. Well, then you should insist on the test. If the family doctor can't do the test within his or her office, they can easily refer you to a local lab to get the test done. So um, you should insist on the test. Um, it is possible, though, if you're on a daily inhaled a daily inhaler, like a daily inhaled steroid, which is a con asthma controlling medication, your test may be normal, and that's because the, um, the, the the asthma treatment is is actually controlling your asthma and and rendering your tests normal. Um, in some cases, if you feel perfectly well on the treatment and your tests are normal, your spirometry is normal. The, the, the doctor and yourself may consider slowly withdrawing the treatment and retesting you to make sure you truly have asthma and confirm the diagnosis. Um, I would suggest that be done because the last thing you want to do is be on a treatment for the rest of your life if you don't actually need that treatment anymore. That's great advice. Um, we have another question here. Can asthma be relapsing and remitting? That is, can I have temporary asthma after I have a bad cold? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's a very good point. And for sure, that does happen. Asthma is a variable disease, and it can be relapsing and remitting. So you may be perfectly well, um, you know, uh, through the summer months. And then um, in the winter months, you may catch a virus, and your asthma may flare at that point. So that's why in some patients who have relapsing and remitting asthma, we, we treat them uh, intermittently with asthma treatment, but we don't keep the treatment going all through the year. So a classic example would be a patient who has um, significant um, um, uh, grass and tree pollen allergy. They may be fine and their asthma may not bother them until the spring months and suddenly they start to flare when, they're, when, they're, um, when their allergies flare. And in patients like that, I may start their inhaled steroid in March and continue the inhaled steroid until the first frost to try to uh, pr prevent their asthma from flaring uh, during their uh, allergy season. But in the winter months, if their asthma isn't flaring and they're not allergic during those months, we can try to stop the medicine. Uh, so again, intermittent treatment is appropriate for some patients who have intermittent asthma. It's not appropriate for people who have persistent asthma. That is asthma that occurs throughout the year. Those people need to be on inhaled steroids often uh, daily. Great. Um, now, what is the standard of care for confirming a diagnosis in young children under six years old uh, where spirometry cannot be performed? That is a, a fantastic question. Um, you're absolutely right. You can't do spirometry in someone who's under six because uh, it, the youngsters often won't cooperate with the procedure and the testing. Um, I am not a pediatrician. I don't see kids. My sense is that in, in kids, unfortunately, um, most of the diagnosis in kids under six is made based on clinical symptoms and, and simply based on the physician listening to the child's lungs and listening for wheezes. So it's much less easy to definitively prove asthma in a young child. It's often just a clinical diagnosis, unfortunately. Once the kid grows up and becomes six or, or, or six years old or greater, they can usually participate in and cooperate with the testing. And at that time, the diagnosis should be confirmed with spirometry. Great. Um, does asthma usually occur when someone has a chronic sinus condition? Uh, asthma and sinus disease can coexist together. So people who have asthma often have allergic... Not all asthma is allergic, but a, a proportion of asthma is allergic. And of course, sinus disease is also allergic. So if you're allergic, for instance, to the cat in your house, you're consistently breathing cat dander, 
That cat dander, those cat hairs, and that shed cat skin is lodging in your upper airway, in your nasal passages and your sinuses, and it's also lodging in your lower airways, down in your lungs. And it's causing um, allergy and, and, uh, and, and inflammation in both the sinuses and in the lungs. Therefore, you're going to present with both sinus symptoms and, and asthma. Um, those two uh, diseases can coexist, but they don't always coexist. There are a lot of asthmatics who don't have any si sinus disease, and there are a lot of people who have sinus disease who don't have asthma. So uh, they're not necessarily coexistent, but they can be. Often, though, if you have both conditions, in order to fully control the symptoms of asthma, the doctor has to think about treating both the sinuses and the lower airways. So often we'll put people on both inhaled steroids to treat their asthma, as well as intranasal steroids to treat their sinus condition. Great. Um, were there any patients who had confirmed diagnosis with spirometry prior to the start of the study who subsequently ended up in the 67% group who didn't have asthma on testing during the study? Uh, a good question. Yeah, it, it, actually, I think you meant the 33% group who didn't have asthma on testing. Yes, there were some. And, and, and those were folks who actually, when we went back and we looked at their medical record from when they were diagnosed, they clearly had asthma at the time of diagnosis, but they no longer had asthma after we took them off of all of their asthma medications and retested them in the study. So what happened here is these were people whose asthma actually went into a remission, a sustained remission. That is, they may have had asthma five years ago, but their asthma was now in remission and they no longer had asthma. In those people, we stopped their me asthma medicines. We followed them for a year. A very small proportion of those folks actually relapsed again and their asthma came back. But most of them were successfully able to stay off asthma medicines for the whole year. Uh, but, but I guess the, the message here is that if you have truly had asthma confirmed with proper testing, there is still a possibility you may go into a sustained remission and may quote unquote, outgrow your asthma over time. Um, just to follow on that, Dr. Aaron, um, should those people ask for retesting? Um, uh, or, I, I should, should, I, or should people ask for retesting? Yeah, yeah. No, it's a very excellent question. My advice is this. Um, if you've been diagnosed with asthma a long time ago and you've been maintained on chronic treatment for asthma, that is an inhaled steroid or another medicine like Monte Lucas, you may know it as Singular. If you've been on these medicines for a long time and you're completely asymptomatic, that is you have no cough, no shortness of breath, no wheeze, you're feeling perfectly well, I think at that point it's reasonable to ask for retesting and do spirometry. And if the spirometry is normal and you're asymptomatic, at that point with your physician, you should consider a trial of tapering your asthma medication. But you have to do this under the supervision of a physician, and you have to be retested as your medicine is tapered to make sure you don't redevelop asthma, because you might. You know, the asthma medicine may be working perfectly well to control all your symptoms, but when you taper the medicine, the asthma could come back. So um, you do this with a doctor, but but it is reasonable to do that if, you, if you're absolutely well-controlled and asymptomatic, your asthma diagnosis should be revisited. Great, thank you. And now this next question, I think you touched on, but um, I'll, I'll ask anyways, um, if there is anything you, you can add. Um, at what age can asthma be properly diagnosed and should it be treated as such until such a time? Yeah, it's basically age six is the threshold at which patients can start to do proper spirometry. Until age six, the, the pediatrician or the family doctor uh, usually makes a based on clinical symptoms and based on the pa parents report of how the how the patient is doing and until that time uh, empiric treatment with asthma medicine oh. so if I go if I bring my, I don't have any young kids anymore I'm too old but if I had brought my four-year-old daughter to the pediatrician and I complained that she was coughing and wheezing at night and when she was running around with her peers she was having trouble breathing chances are the doctor, the pediatrician at that point would make a presumptive diagnosis of asthma and treat my daughter at that point. 
uh, empirically with asthma medicines. And that's appropriate. Until my daughter reaches the age of six, you simply can't do the proper testing to confirm diagnosis. Great, thank you. Um, now, was um, exercise-induced asthma part of the study? Uh, we, yeah, uh, we, we had patients who, um, who in the study who only complained of shortness of breath with exercise, and uh, that is a definite um, uh, type of asthma where people only get their asthma when they exercise. The commonest uh, stimulus is exercising cold, dry air. So a typical patient uh, would complain of shortness of breath or wheeze or cough when they're doing things like cross-country skiing or skating because cold, dry air is the, is the, is the most um, significant uh, stimulus for exercise-induced asthma. Um, and, uh, but you can easily prove exercise-induced asthma in the lab by either simulating the conditions with an exercise test or even simply doing a bronchial challenge test with methacholine. So if you do have exercise-induced asthma, it can still be confirmed using uh, relatively simple um, um, lung function tests. Although I say relatively simple, those tests usually can't be done in a family doctor's office. They have to be done in an accredited lab. Okay, great. Um, given that there have been many educational initiatives for GPs, how can we improve awareness and need for proper diagnosis of asthma? Well, um, that's a great question and one that I'm not an expert on. Um, uh, you know, obviously education will help, but it only goes so far. Um, uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, one way to improve awareness is to have uh, opinion leaders, key opinion leaders, um, speak about this issue and hopefully get the message out to GPs in their meetings, in their continuing medical education, and perhaps in practice guidelines. Uh, another way that this could be done uh, is through the government, because um, you can imagine if the government uh, of Ontario or the government of Quebec or BC um, said that, well, we're not going to pay for asthma medications unless you can show that this patient actually had uh, proper diagnostic testing for asthma, this would increase the, um, the rate of diagnostic testing dramatically. Um, and in BC, they're actually doing that to some degree. In, in British Columbia, I think if you want to prescribe medications for COPD and get them paid for, you have to prove to the government that the patient has actually had spirometry to test for COPD. And in fact, in places like BC, they're very progressive because the government is sponsoring and opening up new lung function laboratories. The crazy thing is in a place where I live, Ontario, the government actually restricts licenses for spirometry and restricts pulmonary function test labs because they're worried about over-testing and the government paying out too much money for testing. Uh, and, and it seems a bit ridiculous to me anyway that the government is worried that uh, doctors would uh, inappropriately do testing uh, when in fact we've shown that doctors are inappropriately not doing the testing. Um, so I think uh, one way to improve things for GPs would be to uh, have government intervene and insist on proper diagnostic testing prior to treatment of asthma and COPD. Great. I didn't know a lot of that. Thanks for uh, letting us know. Um, if you could only either check one reversibility or two do methacholine challenge, which would you do to diagnose asthma? Well, the way we do it is we first always do reversibility testing. So it's, it's, it's basically, it's a stepwise approach. In a patient who has symptoms of asthma, who I suspect asthma, I order pre and post bronchodilator spirometry testing. If that testing is normal and I still suspect asthma, I will then order the bronchial challenge test with methacholine. So it's a stepwise approach. The bronchial challenge test would be the second test if the first test is negative or non-diagnostic. Right. Um, in some instances, access to spirometry can be quite a challenge or it takes a while to get the spirometry report in primary care. How should a GP approach the situation? Yeah, it's very tough for the GP and I feel bad for them about that. Um, <sighs> I mean that that is it that is the issue here. If you're in a if you're let's say you're in a small town and you're the GP and you have someone who's presenting to you with significant symptoms that suggest that this patient could have asthma 
and you know it's going to take three or four weeks to get the spirometry, what do you do then? Um, you're in a difficult position because if you want to be the purist and wait for the spirometry, you're going to subject this patient to three weeks of symptoms without treatment. I would say if it's going to take more than a week to get the spirometry, unfortunately, you may have to put the patient on a short course of treatment, maybe an inhaler for asthma, for a few weeks. And then when the patient is better, consider stopping the treatment and getting the spirometry at that point. Um, ideally, of course, we wouldn't be waiting for these tests. I mean, you know, if a GP suspects pneumonia, the GP can send the patient to the local um, uh, x-ray uh, laboratory, which is often located across the street. And the patient can go to the x-ray clinic and get a chest x-ray. And the x-ray could be read by a, a radiologist and within 24 hours, the GP would have a report back on his or her desk saying whether there's pneumonia or not. For some reason, and I don't know why this is, uh, when, the same, when the same issue occurs and the GP suspects asthma and orders spirometry, uh, the spirometry is just not as accessible as a chest x-ray. And I think we have to change that and we have to lobby our governments and we have to lobby our healthcare uh, systems to make spirometry more accessible and i don't see there's any why there's any reason why we can't have spirometry labs in um in, in the in the uh, x-ray um clinics or in the blood clinics that you have all over the cities um where where if you for instance if you go to get a blood test you could also go and get your spirometry done at the same time and have it interpreted by a respirologist with a report back to the gp within 24 hours that's what we should be working towards Great um, advice. Um, given that asthma can be intermittent, is a negative bronchial challenge test definitive to rule out asthma? Um, it's 98% definitive. Um, so it has a sensitivity of 98%. In other words, there are only 2% there of patients, even those with intermittent asthma, who, who will have a negative bronchial challenge test, assuming they're off all medications. Good to know. Um, is the underdiagnosis of asthma due to low SES a significant issue in Canada? Uh, we think it is. Um, we think that uh, low SES is probably related to underdiagnosis. We're actually testing that in the study we're doing now in the UCAP study. It's probably less of an issue than it is in the US because at least in Canada, even if you're poor, as long as you have a health card, you should be able to access a doctor for free. Uh, in the United States, unfortunately, that doesn't exist. And so we think in Canada, low SCS is going to be less of a, of, of a risk factor, but we still think it will be a risk factor. But I'll be able to prove that in five years when I have my study finished. Looking forward to it. <laughs> um, does premature birth often cause long-term asthma? And do many of these children outgrow it? Yeah, premature birth can be associated with a whole bunch of problems in the lung. Uh, the primary one is that the lungs fail to develop normally in infants who are born prematurely who need to go uh, to an intensive care unit as neonates and need to get on uh, be put on ventilators as neonates. Their lungs don't develop properly, and therefore they're more at risk for lung disease, especially asthma and later in life COPD. Um, so uh, in, a, in, a, in a patient who, who was born significantly premature, that is before 32 weeks, uh, they should probably at some point be followed by a pediatrician and have lung function tests and then be assessed when they grow into adulthood to make sure their lungs are developing normally and that they don't have asthma uh, because it's, it's clearly a risk. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Aaron. I think um, we just have time for one more question. We do have many. Um, so I'll just ask the last question here. For those patients that wish to be better tested, are there avenues for seeking sites or centers that do perform spirometry testing, similar to uh, BP testing and other broad testing programs? Yeah, um, in most, unfortunately, in most provinces, with the exception of British Columbia, a patient has to be referred to the lung function lab for testing. It, uh, you can't just show up there and get a test, unfortunately. Uh, so the best way to get testing is, again, go to your primary care provider or even go to a walk-in clinic 
and say you want spirometry testing or lung function testing, and the doctor will refer you to the local lab where it's done. Great, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for your, uh, for your time, Dr. Aaron. Um, that was very, very informative, very helpful. I, I apologize to those uh, who had questions, but we didn't have time to get to them. Um, uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. And if you've uh, benefited from our webinar series and would like to see similar programming next year, please consider making a donation at asthma.ca slash donate. And if at any point you have further questions, please do email, at us, uh, email us at info at asthma.ca and we'll be happy to help. Um, and just a note, uh, the recording will be available on our website. We will try and get it up as soon as possible. Again, thank you very much. I um, hope uh, you all stay warm and have a lovely rest of the week. Bye now. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.